Thanks for joining us this morning in this webinar on uh, the menu object. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to put them into the panel and we'll get to them at the end. Welcome to today's tutorial. Let's get started. Let's have a look at our agenda for today. Today we are looking at the Seascape menu object. We'll look at what is the Seascape menu object and when is it useful. Then we'll talk about the different options you have with the menu object. Then we'll show you how to set up the menu object in Seascape and how to use it at runtime. We'll have demonstrations throughout and as always we'll finish with a Q&A session. So what is the Seascape menu object? The Seascape menu object is a graphical object available in the Seascape graphics editor, which is where you do all the user interface configuration, including the graphics development. The menu object is one of the most comprehensive graphical objects available because it provides you with everything you need to design and fully implement a menu structure. In some applications, the menu structure is a very effective user interface tool. So when is the menu object most useful? That object is useful with applications where you have a large amount of data to be displayed or a large number of parameters that need to be set in the machine. It's also useful with applications where you have a relatively small screen, such as an XLE, an XLT, or maybe one of our micro OCS series, such as the X4 or the X5. So what can you actually do with the menu object? The menu object allows you to create a hierarchical menu structure with a series of menus and sub-menus to lead your user through your data or through the parameters that they need to operate the machine. You can have many different items in your menu. For example, you can display static text, you can set up sub-menus, you can display real-time data, which is either read-only or editable, and you can do screen jumps to help with screen navigation. Now let's look at how we set up the menu object in Seascape. So in the Seascape graphics editor, you go to the icon toolbar and select the menu object icon, which is highlighted on the right. Then click within the screen area of your editor and drag that window to size. The menu object always works best when it's full screen, or in other words, when it's the only object on the screen. So after you've sized it on your screen, take the handles on each side and stretch it to full screen. Then double click that menu object to open the main dialog box. First, let's look at the items in the upper left hand corner of this dialog. The first one is called exclusive focus. That means that as soon as the user navigates to the screen that contains the menu object, it will already be active and ready to use. And there's nothing the user has to do to make it active. With a typical object that has an action to it, the first thing the user usually has to do is touch that object for it to be active or to have focus. So you should check that if the menu object is the only object on the screen. The next option is the selection bar, which can either be full length or not. Almost all the time you want that menu selection bar to be full length. If you take a look at this real world application of this XLE with a menu screen being displayed, you can see that the IO status menu item is fully highlighted all the way from left to right. That's because it was created with the select full length option checked. The next thing we'll look at is the option to have a sub menu selection register or a sub menu selection variable. If you want your navigation to be automated or overridden, this variable can be used in the program to accomplish that. This is an optional feature, which is essentially a variable that's going to contain a numerical value, which can be an indicator of where the user is in the menu navigation. If you write to that register, you can automatically cause navigation to a specific location in the menu. If you do utilize that register, you'll initialize it to a value of zero, so that when the user starts off at the menu, they're starting off at the highest level. Whereas if you leave it with a non-zero value, they'll start out somewhere deeper in the system menu. Then you can begin configuring your menu pages by pressing the button in the upper right hand corner. Then you can start adding items to your menu. Here we're looking at the main menu page dialog and you can hit the add button to start adding items to your menu. There's a variety of items you can add which are listed here on the screen. Those features include a sub menu page pointer, numeric data fields, ASCII data fields, a text table, time and date displays, password data fields and screen jumps. 
So these are all the things that are available as items on your menu. Let's start with a very common item for you to put on your main menu, which would be a sub menu page. By putting this item on the main menu, you'll allow the user to select it and navigate to a sub menu. For this sub menu, you just need to provide a name under the prompt text field and decide whether you want it left justified, center justified or right justified. And most of the time with menus, you leave everything as left justified. When the user selects this at runtime, they'll navigate to this submenu, but the actual configuration of the submenu we will do in a later step. Another thing we can add is a numeric data item. For this, you just need to configure the prompting text, which is a bit like the legend that you would have on an individual data item. So in that field, you just have descriptive text. Then you select the type of data field, and then input where it's referenced when filling in the attributes field. One thing that you have to do in the menu object that you don't in a traditional numeric object is that the minimum limit and the maximum limit must be filled in appropriately for your data fields, whether it's editable or not. Whereas with a traditional numeric data field, that only applies to an editable data field. And note that here you have a choice between an editable data field or a non-editable data field. With a non-editable data field, it will be displayed on your menu list, but it won't be selectable because it's just there to display read-only data. Whereas with a read-write or editable data field, they'll be able to select that and then go in and edit it. Another useful item is a text table item. This is just another type of data object where we show the results with a text string. Again, fill out all of your attributes and don't forget to create the text table if it hasn't already been created. The screen jump is another useful item. With a screen jump item, when the operator selects that at runtime, they will jump to the screen that you've selected when you've configured it. If you want the user to be able to navigate back to the menu by pressing the escape key, then make sure the escape to return option is checked. One thing to note is that as of current firmware from when this webinar was made, the escape action, instead of escaping back into the menu from which the jump occurred, Instead, it's going to jump back to the top level of the menu. And that only applies to you if you have multiple levels to your menu. Finally, let's look at the no entry item. This is a convenient way to put some static text as an item on the screen. That text can't be selected and it's simply display only. There's a variety of things you could use this no entry item for. For example, it could be informational or for legend type space near another data field. Next, let's look at how we configure those submenus that we put on our main menu. Once you put submenu items on your main menu, you'll see that on the left side of the dialog, you now have a hierarchy pane with those submenus showing up in a tree structure from where they can be selected and edited. Another way that you can select and edit a submenu is by selecting the item from the main menu list and then hitting the expand submenu button. Next, let's look at other options that are available in the dialog box for configuration. The first thing we'll look at is this enables register. That's an optional advanced feature that allows you to remove or hide items on the list. For that, you have a 32-bit variable you can assign, which is one bit allocated to each item on your menu or submenu. So you could have as many as 32 items on your menu or submenu with each item corresponding to one of the bits in the enables register. If a bit is a 1, the corresponding item is visible, and if that bit is a 0, it's not visible. So why would you want to do that? Well, one example could be if you have a user that doesn't have authorization, so you want to hide some of those options from them. Remember, again, that that is an optional feature. Now let's begin our demonstration where we'll look at setting up that menu object in Seascape. So I'll open Seascape. Here we have an application for setting up an XLE to act as a remote IO block off of Ethernet IP, which we have used in different webinars. Part of this application is the user interface, which is designed so that the user can set up the IO block and also monitor the status of any of the IO. For this, we have many screens with jump commands to navigate from screen to screen. For this demo, we'll take a similar application, which again is for using the XLE as a remote I.O. block, but to base the user interface on a menu object instead, and see how that is different. So I'll open up the graphics editor. 
here i have my xle and in this application i only have two screens configured one screen with a comprehensive menu object and another screen that we can use to set up the ethernet parameters for the xle as a remote io block but let's start with the menu object screen so this is a menu object that has been stretched to full screen so that it occupies the entire screen. I'll double click on it and go into configuration. Here I chose exclusive focus so the object is running and ready to go as soon as the user sees it. They don't have to do anything to enable the object. I also checked select full length. This is where we can configure the color scheme of both the header and the items in the menu object. So let's quickly look at the OCS to see how that looks. You can see at the top the header is the XLE Model 6 IO and then the menu items are listed below the solid line. For a monochrome OCS we have to select the same color scheme for both the header as well as the items. For a color OCS we can set those independently. Next let's look at the configure menu pages option and see how we configured our main menu. On our main menu, we added four items to that list. The first item was a text table item to give the operator the ability to see quickly if the system was okay or not. If the system is okay, then they will see yes, and if not, they'll see no. For that, we just had to configure the register or variable that the data or text table item is tied to and how many ASCII digits we want to display. In this case, the longest thing we need to display is yes, which is three digits. And we had to make sure we have a text table selected, which in this case is text table number one. And that's either going to show no for zero and yes for one. So that's just a text table item placed at the top of my main menu. Next, I have an option for the user to select an IO status sub menu. For that, all we have to configure is the name as well as the justification. Again, the details of that submenu will be configured elsewhere and will show that shortly. After that, on my main menu, I have a screen jump for going to the Ethernet setup screen. So I selected screen jump here and then selected the screen number. I also checked the allow escape to return, allowing the user to come back to the menu system when they're done with that screen by pressing escape. Finally, we have another submenu, which is my Ethernet status submenu. So that is my main menu. My submenus show up as the next level below my main menu. Here I have my IO status menu and my Ethernet status menu. The easiest way for me to configure those is just to click on them, and then the IO status menu is brought up here. And in this case, each of these items is a pointer to another submenu for looking at the status for each of my different types of I.O., which are a digital in, digital out, analog in, analog out, and high speed counter data. For each of these submenus, all we did was name them and set the justification. Then in the hierarchy pane, my submenus are the next level down. And from here, I can individually go in and configure each of those. Here is my digital in submenu. So here I have many numeric data fields that I want the operator to see for the status. With this approach, I have it so that on the first line, the operator can see the state of all 12 inputs, and then they can scroll down to each of the 12 individual inputs to see whether they're on or off. The configuration for each of these items is just a matter of selecting the address and the register width, then selecting binary as the format, and selecting how many digits I want to display. In this case, I'm just displaying one bit on or off. And finally, I make sure the min and max are set appropriately. For my digital output submenu, I've configured that identically. I also have 12 outputs and the user can see at a glance the status of all 12 outputs at once, or they can scroll down through them individually. For the analog input submenu, again, I have my numeric data However, this time, instead of it being binary information, it is signed decimal information. So here, it was important that my minimum limit and my maximum limit are set to appropriate values to make sure I'm getting the data display that I wanted. Otherwise, what I could see instead would be a series of arrows left or right indicating my values are out of range. Then I set up the analog out identically. 
these are all numeric data fields and again I've done the same for the high speed counter submenu except with the high speed counter each of these data fields is a double integer with much larger minimum and maximum limits. So that is what my IO status submenus look like. Now let's look at the Ethernet status submenu. Here I just have three items and none of them are submenus. There is a link OK indicator which is a text table which will say yes if the link is working and no if not. Then we have the scanner OK indicator which does the same thing with the scanner. Then we have connections which is the numeric data field that's tied to the lower 8 bits of the Ethernet IP status register and that tells us how many active connections we have with the OCS or that the OCS has with external devices. So that's the configuration in Seascape for the menu object. As you can see, you can set up some sophisticated menu systems all on one screen. Now let's look at that on the OCS. Here is our XLE. First, I'll just show you the navigation. So here we have our IO status menu as our first option. As I use the arrow keys to navigate up and down, Note that anything that's selectable is highlighted as it is selected. The system OK status at the top showing yes or no is just a display of data and it's not selectable. So I'll select the Ethernet setup which is a jump command to another screen. I'll hit enter to jump to that screen. And here I can go in and change the configuration for the Ethernet set of parameters. And then I can hit escape and I'll go back to the top level of my menu. So that was the Ethernet setup. Now let's look at Ethernet status. Here there's nothing for me to navigate to because none of these are selectable. They are all just informational displays. I can see the status of link OK, scanner OK and how many connections are established. Currently I have one with an Ethernet IP scanner and I have another one with Seascape. So we're seeing two connections here. Now I'll hit escape. And now let's look at the IO status menu. This is where we have our choice of all the different types of IO. Let's start with the digital inputs. As those digital inputs are manipulated, you'll see the status change here. We can continue to scroll down as we go, well below the lower limits of the screen. And you can see everything changing. Now I can go back and this time I'll go into the digital outputs. Similarly, here I can scroll through all the different IO statuses. On the analog input side, I can see the current value of the two analog inputs that I actually have connected. Three and four are open circuit, which is why they have values of minus 6,400. And then on the analog output side, there's only one coming over from ethernet IP and the others are just fixed at zero. Finally, we have our high speed counter option, which shows us the current count on our high speed counter. So that is a menu driven user interface based on the Seascape graphical menu object. Thank you for joining us for today's tutorial and the Q&A session will begin shortly. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm not seeing any questions in just yet. Um, so next week our webinar is on arrays in tag based ladder. Uh, the registration link is up in the webinar section of the website as usual if you would like to join us for that. Um, other than that, thank you all for joining us this morning and we do hope to see you again next weekend, next week. So 